Um, this is a uh, view from the north, a view from Canada and to Canada. We talked to Ken Rogers uh, in Kelowna, Canada. And uh, last time we talked about the relationship of inflation and the economy and uh, you know the health of the country in general and the health of the relationship with Canada, how Canada would do in various circumstances and how Europe and Asia would do. But we're not finished with that. As we left it, we were going to address uh, some of the wrinkles uh, that come out of the climate change factor. Yeah, so we still have the issue of the default, Ken. Um, that's still possible. Um, it's in the paper every day, but it's not clear that they will ever agree or that McCarthy will ever uh, come around and uh, just lift the debt uh, ceiling, which is what he has, what what the government has been doing for decades. Um, so, if the uh, here's the question uh, to follow: is we don't know exactly um, what's going to happen on that, or when it's going to happen, or how long it's going to it's going to stick in place. We don't know about a lot of the factors that you and I talked about last time, um, especially including, you know, what could happen on climate change and extreme weather, floods, drought, forest fires in Western Canada, what have you. We do not know what's going to happen on that. And we don't have a sense, uh, you know, I know that AI could help us. We don't have a sense of the, um, you know, priorities, uh, which one has greater weight we don't have a sense of you know, all the factors we talked about. Um, we don't have a sense of the, um, you know, the, the duration element. Some people say that the longer these factors stay in place, it's, it's better than some people say the longer they stay in place, it's worse. Um, you know, so it's, uh, it's, it kind of needs an algorithm. Speaking of which, you know, I went and I put in the questions that uh, we raised last time. Um, and I uh, looked at those questions uh, and the answers in chat GBT. And guess what? Uh, you were right on everything. I'm impressed. Your, edu your education speaks for you, Ken. <laughs> at least you agree with chat GBT anyway. Well, my, my <laughs> former wife would have never agreed with that. <laughs> I was always wrong. <laughs> So, you know, since we spoke about this subject, um, the uh, the Fed has, what, raised uh, the rediscount rate just a little bit? And the uh, question, you know, well, why? Is that a good move? Because, you know, if you lined up 15, um, you know, economists and 15 journalists, uh, you'd get uh, 37 answers on whether it was a good move or not. Not clear. What do you think? If you're trying to curb inflation, that's the right thing to do. You know, it's just that simple. Yeah, but you know, the other factors that are hand in glove, for example, the jobs report came out since we spoke, and the jobs report was good. Um, we have less unemployment. But if you have less unemployment, you have, um, you know, more money. This is your analysis last time, feeding into the economy. And if you have that, then you have a greater prospect of inflation. So these things don't work necessarily in, in tandem. They Sometimes they work against each other. Um, so uh, how do you feel about that? Some people say that we are not going to get out of the, the risk of recession. Uh, we are not going to get out of inflation until we have a bad jobs report. That's usually a, a logical answer. Um, that's because uh, inflation usually... Um, causes problems with uh, employment, you know, but your, your employment factor, like if you have um, uh, wage or wage push kind of thing, if wages go up, you're going to have more inflation. Like if wages get um, uh, where the expectations of the unions and the employees are such that they believe there will be more inflation, they will keep pushing for higher wages. You know, so importantly, the Federal Reserve and government agencies, if they're responsible, will try to jawbone that expectation down and say, you know, we're going to raise interest rates until the economy it loses a bit of steam and, uh, you know, wage demands, uh, it, uh, you don't need them because we're going to curb the inflation. However, you know, you, you can have um, 
uh, you know, some inflation and, and uh, you know, your labor market's really strong. Well, that correlates in the direction that the, the labor market uh, may be one of the causes of the inflation. You know, and so you need to cool those expectations or you need to encourage people to uh, companies to hire less people. You know, you 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 just cannot have inflation at a high number for for very long. Otherwise, you're going to have the expectations um, that inflation will keep going and and all of the factors will start to Ca- keep causing it to go higher and higher and and in you know not too long you'll have a mess like you have in Argentina mm-hmm. you well know, you know I, I've been thinking about expectations uh, since we spoke last and you mentioned that was one of the three pillars if you will of inflation um, but I've been thinking about you know it's kind of subjective we, we all know that uh, uh, economics is uh, is an art not a science um, and you know, talking about expectations, talking about talking about psychology, social psychology on a grand scale affecting 330 million people. And I've been thinking that the media gives mixed messages, um, and the combined you know message from the media and social media, and and from the pundits, you know, the economists who appear on the media, um, and for that matter, from the opinion writers in the newspapers, um, I get a really mixed message. Some say mm, this is good. Some say mm, it's bad, and people in general are probably, uh, see if you agree with me, they're probably uncertain which way is good, which way is bad, whether we like what's happening or don't like what's happening. And that leads to what do we call it? Uncertainty and therefore expectations that are mixed. So if you look around the country for expectations in a given moment now, in our world today of divisiveness and political trouble. It's hard to find a, a single strain, a, a single sensibility. Uh, and what you find is that people are on both sides of the issue. And so if you're looking at that third category, that third factor you spoke of, expectations, um, you know, it's it's hard to get a clear read on that. Some people think we're going to stay in cash, other people not, um, because cash, you know, depreciates with inflation. Um, so, I, I mean, how do you handle that? What's the priority among the three factors you discussed of expectations now? Well, I I don't agree with one of your premises. You know, the premise that, you know, the public can't make up their mind, you know, about certain economic factors. I think there's zero question whatsoever that the public believes that inflation is a bad thing. You know, too much inflation in particular is a bad thing. You know, the only time that the public thinks otherwise is in the value of their house. The public doesn't even connect inflation and the stock market. You know, the very wealthy people will, you know, count that to a degree, but not Joe Public. Um, Now, similarly, Joe Public believes that... um, a really strong jobs market is good. Any weakness in the job market sucks. It's really bad. You know, last time we hit the points of um, where expectations was really the third factor, but but the dominant one that gets really scary, you know, when it causes it to get out of hand. So you have cost push inflation, you know, and, and so you have... Um, you know, in the um, in the current market, uh, you know, countries are fighting over each other for you know the people to build a um, a battery plant, lithium battery plant. You know, so that they're you know fighting over each other. Like Canada and the U.S. right now is who who can pay the most to some company to have put the plant in their location that push, you know, ups the cost of that. And that would cause inflation if that cost is higher than otherwise. If you picked an ordinary item, um, you know, that, you know, if you had a run on toilet paper, you know, you'd, you'd have, if everybody thinks it's going to run out, 
you'd have a a demand uh, demand pull would cause the price of toilet paper to go up if everybody's trying to rush and fill up their bantry with it. You've got, you know, other factors that that when you're managing the economy or trying to, you know, if you're the Federal Reserve Bank or you're, um, you know, the U.S. federal government, the various agencies that have got like Treasury and such that are trying to manage the economy, you know, they're looking at all the factors and and recognize that if you have um, if you start to get too much inflation, you know, you you need to stomp on it. You know, if you have uh, unemployment, you need to do something like during COVID, uh, you know, the response was you're going to have unemployment. People are staying at home. Let's let's print a bunch of bunch of checks and send them out to people so they can stay alive and until they can get back to work. We've had a couple of things here in the past um, few days, actually. One is uh, the Fed's increase in the rate by a, a modest amount, but nevertheless an increase. I find that interesting. At the same time, there have been a number of uh, commentators and reporters who have said that, hey, inflation is down and down for the month of April, and it looks good for the year 2023 and 2024. Um, so th- there is there are signs that we are out of danger as far as inflation is concerned, particularly on 2024, I can't for the life of me understand how they can pro- project that with so many variables in the world today. But that's that's what a lot of them have said. Do you accept that? Sort of. I mean, when you say there are so many variables, well, the econometric models, which people like the Federal Reserve and major banks and major corporations have uh, involving artificial intelligence can handle at, you know, a ridiculous number of factors, and and it's really the human judgment on how to weigh them. That yeah, really right, I agree. Whether, whether they're going to be successful or whether they're going to fail in their attempt to steer or tweak the economy to in, in the direction they want. I mean, uh, you know, I tend to think, for example, the current Republican push to cause a crisis to do with the debt ceiling really is an a political ploy believing that if they can make a big enough mess you know biden and the uh, will be to blame you know the public basically thinks whoever's the president that that's who's running the government and therefore if it's good we like him if the if something happens uh you know, if the if the Republicans can create this mess, Biden will be blamed for it. Period. Aside from the blame issue, suppose they can't cut a deal, um, and we don't have a lifting and an increase in the debt ceiling. That's a disaster um, because it would affect not only this country but you know the world. Um, and and here's the other point: is that how fixable is it? In other words. Those negative implications of of not raising the debt ceiling, it's not like you can fix it overnight because they have a long shadow. Um, They have a a momentum, if you will, here and there and everywhere. All all the economies that are affected by the U.S., the strongest economy in the world, will suffer. And if you turn around and say, we were only kidding, we're perfectly willing (laughs) to increase the debt ceiling, that doesn't necessarily solve it. So no. you know you you have damage that is profound on day one, or at least uh, in the middle of June, anyway. Well, you have to get back to sort of the the cause or the underlying factors. You know, like to say, so what if the you know if I didn't uh, let's say I impose on you a debt ceiling. In, on you personally, well, that wouldn't affect you at all. You know, your your employment income would continue. You could still pay your rent, and you could still, uh, uh, you know, keep your wife happy, and you could chug along. There Isaac are did. other factors that would that would apply to me. For example, if the Republicans got into office and undermined Social Security and Medicare, uh, and then you added that. 
to my whatever my debt structure is, then you have a multiplier effect. And I really do care. Let, let me come back to the causes for the U.S. economy and the debt situation. Essentially, the United States only spends more money than the rest of the wealthy countries in the world in, on two things, military and prisons. They don't spend wow. anywhere as much as everybody else on everything else. The um, U.S. pays so uh, so much less for social security and uh, uh, the social safety net than everybody else. And put the numbers in perspective first, you'd have uh, Western Europe has 40% of their gross domestic product um, that um, is uh, government spending. Uh, in the United States and in Europe, you know, they have a tax rate roughly the same. You know, that each country may run a modest deficit, but the United States, um, they um, spend so little on um, social programs that, that really their total um, government expenditure as a percentage of GDP is around 26%. In part due to the Trump tax cuts, you know, there the deficit of the U.S. is six percent, or six billion dollars rather, which is really about twenty percent of what the government spends. So that if you think of, you know, what, the debt ceiling, what what happens, you know, nobody really knows for sure. So you got to say, well, the the United States starts with a position that that. And if you just thought of it an, on an annualized basis, if you're going to spend six trillion, rather, I've got to get the right. Yeah, thank <laughs> yeah, you. Yeah, the trillion. The, the number you trillion. were thinking of was yeah. six trillion. Yeah, okay. Trillion. Okay. If you got to have, if you're going to spend six trillion more than you got in income in taxes, then you got to borrow that. Hence, we're getting the, close to the idea of the debt ceiling, or if you say, well, gee, the Republicans say, we're not going to let you borrow. So, so, But you're underneath, you've got the cause is the United States spends less money on everything except military and, and prisons than all other wealthy countries. They do spend so much less on the social safety net that you really have poverty and inequality in the United States are really they're they're more far more widespread and they're far more stubborn than there are in any of the other wealthy countries. And a great example of the result of that is the average life expectancy in the United States is six years less. Than, than the other members of the G7 or wealthy countries. How about less than Canada? Yeah, oh well, yeah. And, and in Canada, uh, our life expectancy is a couple years less than, than Western Europe, but about four years better than in the US. Uh, but Canada is kind of in between in some regards. For example, our uh, income or government tax take um, is about um, 33%, the U.S. about 26%, uh, and Europe about 40 Europe has a ton of social programs, though. That's correct. Um, now, but is that good, bad, or indifferent? I mean, if you're the guy on the street in, in um, the United States, or you're in Mississippi, and you're just an ordinary person getting starving to death or, you know, having a lot of trouble making ends meet, um, you know, you'd, you'd say Europe's far better than than what you have there. But, uh, you know, if you're the uh, multimillionaire American, you say that's terrific. Uh, we don't want to have any taxes at all. Mm -hmm. You know, just everybody can fend for themselves. You know, 20 years ago, Ken, maybe more, when we started noticing um, people on the street homeless, you know, and 
uh, okay, we had that in Hawaii, and it was some indication that it was happening elsewhere. But now it's kind of knitting together and that every city has homeless. And very few jurisdictions do much about it, some more, some less. But the fact is that we have homeless who are off the grid, don't have a home, don't have any money, don't have anything, medical care. And I say to myself, this is more than just a bunch of people who couldn't pay their bills or wouldn't pay their bills, who were not disciplined in their lives, who didn't you know, take enough education, who didn't try hard enough, all that you know, kind of Republican view of it. But it signifies that the system is broken. The system is broken not only here in Hawaii in terms of that, but all across the mainland. And, and you have it in Canada, too, maybe to a lesser degree. And, you know, for that matter, it, it No, happens. we don't. It's not a lesser degree. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, you know, uh, the, um, if you recall, we had a, a program uh, one I, I uh, about Vancouver and, and yeah. a thing called Hastings Street. Well, they're, they're still trying to clean up Hastings Street, but, uh, you know, it's a great cause and effect uh, result. It's a metric, isn't it? I mean, not that you would count the people on the street, but just a, on a gestalt level, you see every city has all these people that are homeless and have no no options and no prospects. Well, you say you this take, is not a working economy. Well, if you take the social safety net, you know, and, and if, if you take your most extreme liberal approach and say all oh, all these poor people we all we have to do something well if you really look at the people you really have alcohol addiction drug addiction and uh, mental illness now those three items you know uh, are the root cause of about 90 percent of the homelessness yeah well you got to do something about it and yeah, you, gotta, but, you know, we got to re, re, resuscitate those people, re, re, rehabilitate them, and we we don't do that. And and in the modern world, there's plenty of drugs, there's plenty of alcohol, there's plenty of places to fall down. And if you want to maintain a stable society and a stable economy and a stable rate of inflation, I suppose you really have to address that. And the problem is, and this is a, I, I always wanted to put this question to you. The problem is that Joe Biden can spend a ton of money on, on social safety and on social programs. He can outdo, you know, Europe. I mean, assuming no debt ceiling, he can spend, you know, trillions and trillions, and he can probably, you know, make some inroads on these social problems in the country. But somewhere, Milton Friedman should be here with us today. Somewhere, there's got to be a red line. Somewhere, the money runs out. Somewhere, the country as an entity, as a polity, cannot continue to exist if you keep on digging in your pocket and printing more money or finding more money or taking more money. I, I, I wonder where the red line is and how close we are to it and how that you know, affects our inflation and, for that matter, our relations with other countries and the world in terms of what do you want to call it, economic policy. I tend to think, you know, in Canada, our biggest problem with the um, dealing with the homeless people, it, you know, comes back to those um, three factors of, uh, you know, drug addiction, uh, alcohol addiction, and mental illness. Is is our legal system really has a a pretty simple catch and release policy, you know, so that all of these homeless people continue to create a stream of of small crimes most of them are small you know but you do have large crimes arising from them but on these um small crime they'll go by and they'll break the window of a storefront you know on purpose um well you know they just get to spend one night in jail and they're back out you know well you know really if your government expenditure doesn't have to be billions and billions of dollars, and, but um, if it brought the U.S. a little closer to what, you know, Western Europe is or even to where Canada is, you know, you could have those. Um, if you're picked up on one of these petty crimes, 
you know, you must go through an alcohol uh, addiction test, a drug test, and a mental illness test. And if you, you know, hit any of those buttons, you know, you, you fail those tests, then you, you immediately got to go somewhere. You know, for example, in in Canada, in the United States, uh, you know, 25, or well, I guess it might be 50 years ago, we used to have mental institutions you know they well they got closed down you know well, gee that's an inhumane thing well you know if you have all those people walking around the street or sleeping on the street it's no bloody wonder mm, to say you nothing know, about you know, the people walking around with guns well they including those whether they have alcohol, drug, or mental illness, they, you know, in the United States, they can all qualify for an AR-15. <laughs> you know, well, I think we must be approaching a red line somewhere. I mean, I, I just don't think that uh, today's modern Western societies, societies in general everywhere, um, you know, have the possibility of sp spending what it takes, you know, to, to preserve their society, their democracy, their their social experience. And then, okay, and here's the question, my last question to you today, but it was also my first question, is then on top of that, you have something that's less predictable. Um, you have the floods and the forest fires. You have the droughts that affect uh, agriculture. Uh, you have all of these things that flood down on us from climate change, but which we have not spent any money in, in deferring and deterring. Um, and which we're going to have to, you know, deal with on an emergency basis, which is going to cost a lot of money. So, you, uh, so you start with an unworkable proposition, and subject to the surprise of surprises, that climate change is expensive. So, when you add it all together, there isn't enough, there isn't enough money to handle this. And my question to you is: Let's assume that's the case. Sooner, not later. You know, talk about duration. If climate change can do real damage, and you and you have to put money in to fix it, you know, it's just sort of like Ukraine has been completely demolished. You've got to put money in to fix it. Where's the money coming from? Um, and how do we handle that as a as a fiscal policy matter? How do we handle that as a banking matter, an investment matter? Do we have the institutional structures and the money to do that? Or does something really awful happen when we run out of money as a country, as a society? I don't agree with you that there's not enough money. You know, there's just not enough um, will, you know, particularly political will. You know, if you think of uh, JFK following when the Russians put Sputnik up in the air and zoomed around, you know, and he immediately gave his sparkling speech uh, or series of them but i particularly remember one about uh, you know we will get to the moon and we can do it and blah 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 well that was a very expensive effort to create nasa and the u.s program you know but really in terms of the total scale of the u.s financial capability it was diddly squat well, that was a different time. And if you look at the national debt then and now, it's way different. It's not in the way it was, 20, 20 trillion dollars or something along those lines. Well, when you went, went, went through World War II, there were humongous deficits. We were really active economy following World War II. And it was, it was, you never saw growth like that ever. And um, that, that helped, didn't it? How did that arise compared to today you see and and if you start in 1946 or 1950 you know where the wealthy in canada and i'm not sure of the numbers in the us the marginal tax rate was like 90 percent you know and the very wealthy were not willing to pay that you know the, canada even created a program of uh, buck a year men uh, where they had the the most talented, wealthy people in the country <clears throat> work for the government for a dollar a year to um, achieve all kinds of things for the war effort. 
So you come out of the war with those, with a mindset of those very, very wealthy people, you know, that they could do anything, but they, you know, didn't need to have zero taxes. You know, they were very acceptance that, that you know, the, the country, everybody was pretty equal. You know, the poor guy at the bottom of the rung, you know, his brother got killed in the war and his, you know, sister was a nurse in the war and, you know, and and he's got a broke, you know, a bullet in the leg or something, uh, you know, and, and the rich guy treats him better than the rich guy does today. Mm, yeah, true. Uh, the question is, how do we get back to that? That is the question, because we have left that behind in history, all of that. It's a beautiful picture. It's the greatest generation on both sides of the border, all over the, all over the place. And the Marshall Plan and all the, all the things that um, the U.S. did or tried to do in those years. In any event, Ken, uh, thank you again for a great show and a great discussion. Uh, we'll, we'll talk some more about comparative what voting rights next time, and uh, we'll see what we can do. Back to Ken Rogers in, in finance and in fiscal policy, in, in, in global history and wisdom. Thank you so much, Ken. Bye for now. Aloha. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.